Hello and welcome to the lecture, 2402 lecture on nutrition and metabolism. So we're going to start off uh, with an overview of cellular respiration. So I'll tell you about metabolism here in a minute, but basically these are chemical reactions that take place in our body which are meant to uh, generate molecules that we can use to complete tasks. And the molecule, the main molecule that we're going to be dealing with here, you can see in the upper right here, and that's ATP. So our goal in this whole process is to make this ATP adenosine triphosphate. Now, if you look over here at this, it, there's, there's a lot going on in this, but it's not, not that much. And I'm gonna keep it at about this level of simplicity when I break it down for you. Uh, you recognize this big yellow thing here as a mitochondrion. And so that means that this stuff out here is the cytoplasm or cytosol. And here we see our starting molecule, glucose. So you guys get a lot of glucose. Uh, anytime you eat starch or anytime you eat sugar, uh, you're, you have these glucose monomers part of that uh, food. And even aside from that, you can make glucose out of lots of other molecules. If I eat nothing but protein, I'm gonna turn some of those components of the protein into glucose. If I eat nothing but lipids, I'm gonna turn some of them into glucose. Because I need to get ATP, because ATP does pretty much everything. If I wanna contract the muscle, if I wanna send a nervous impulse, if I wanna make a molecule, if I wanna maintain cells, all of those things require ATP. So uh, we, we have to have it, and glucose is kind of the easiest uh, uh, source to explain the process. There are gonna be one, two, three, four total steps that I will outline. Uh, here you see the names and I'll have them again. Glycolysis is the first one. This one's not named, but I'm gonna call it the transition reaction. That's the name I learned a long time ago. So I'm gonna stick with it. This is called Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. And as I said, I'll have these on the board here in a minute. And then the electron transport chain. Uh, notice that the glucose starts off out here in the cytoplasm. And the first step takes glucose and breaks it down. This is this is why they call it glycolysis, glycolysis, because you lyse or split glucose. Glucose uh, formula is C6H12O6. Um, so it has six carbons. And when I break it in half into these two pyruvate molecules, I'm gonna end up with two molecules that have three carbons each. So we'll kind of keep track of the carbons here as we go. Those pyruvates are moved into the mitochondrion and they form two molecules, these two pyruvates form two molecules of acetyl-CoA, which liberates some things. And you can see some things being liberated here, uh, uh, NADH and then FADH2 over here. I'll talk about those molecules in detail and I'll come back to this diagram here and make more sense at the end. Um, those two acetyl-CoA molecules then are uh, entered into this process, this set of reactions called Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle which liberates a bunch more of these NADH and FADH2 molecules. And you'll, you'll notice that they all go, they're all going here to this fourth step. So whenever we generate NADH or FADH2, we're going to just deal with it later, table that for the, the last reaction set here called electron transport. Now this last reaction set here really generates the most ATP. And you can see at the bottom here, uh, what kind of ATPs we're generating in these steps. Uh, two on average here from glycolysis, we'll just call this the just null. Two here from uh, Krebs cycle, and then you can get a maximum of about 34 ATP in this reaction set. So from one glucose, we can get two plus two plus 34, so about 38, and again, that's kind of optimal. Now let's go to the board. I'm gonna turn on some lights. My cameraman gets ready. Get that's full lighting, that's probably good there. So first I just want to make sure you understand kind of basic uh, metabolism. Now the term metabolism, you've all heard before, and usually it's brought up when you're talking about um, weight gain or weight maintenance or weight loss. Somebody may say I have a high metabolism or high metabolic rate or whatever. Um, how much, how many calories you burn basically sitting around is part of your metabolism, but really if you look at the big picture, what is metabolism? Metabolism is all of the chemical reactions that take place in your body. So chemical reactions that break down molecules, chemical reactions that build molecules, uh, any reaction is part of your metabolism. So basically it's kind of like your overall physiology, chemical physiology. 
there are two basic classes of reaction. You've got reactions that are called anabolic, and I've kind of drawn a little picture here. Oops, I've drawn a picture poorly, haven't I? Oh, I'm such an idiot. Oh, wait, watch this. I can fix it. That'll teach me not to proofread myself. I can fix this. So, two basic reaction types. Catabolic now on top, and anabolic here is on the bottom. Catabolic breaks down a big molecule into smaller molecules. So catabolism is a type of reaction, or cat catabolic reaction is a type of reaction that's going to take big molecules, break them into small molecules, and generally you're breaking chemical bonds, if you remember the chemical bonds from uh, NP1, like covalent bonds, and you break a covalent bond, almost always you're going to release some energy that was held in those bond in that bond so that energy that gets released in a catabolic reaction can be used for another job right um, just like when you when you burn gasoline in your car that's a catabolic reaction you're 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 igniting the gasoline breaking the bonds between those carbons in gasoline and the heat and uh, pressure that is being generated moves your car so you can convert one form of energy chemical into another form in your car, which is mechanical. But we're going to convert a lot of chemical energy into more chemical energy when we, when we make AT, ATP. Uh, here we see energy is released. When an energy, when a reaction releases energy, it's called exergonic. So gonic is energy, and exer means out. So out, energy goes out. The opposite is anabolic. And if you think of the, whenever you hear the term anabolic, you always, the, the first thing that comes to mind is anabolic steroids. So they make your muscles bigger, anabolic steroids. Not really the exact same use of the word, but anabolic reactions make bigger molecules. So it's an easy way to remember it. Take two small molecules, bind them together so you're gonna form a chemical bond and make a big molecule. Of course, making bonds takes energy. So you have to put energy into the reaction or it has to be endergonic to make bigger molecules. And we'll see that we're going to be uh, over the course of this, we're mostly going to be focusing on catabolic reactions until really the very end, and bits and pieces in between. Uh, so most of our reactions are going to be catabolic here, uh, at least the ones we're focusing on. So let's move down to the steps. And if you, I don't know how far over you can see, but you can see definitely steps one and two, perhaps. Uh, and then we'll get over there to steps three and four. But trust me, there's going to be four steps, just like we showed on the the screen up there. And here, here they are kind of broken down into their key, uh, some key features of each. So glycolysis, uh, oh, this is by the way, carbohydrate metabolism. And I put a little slash here, cell respiration. So if you heard the term uh, cellular respiration or ATP synthesis or, uh, well, that's about it. Those are the only two. So, or aerobic respiration or anaerobic respiration, whenever you hear that term respiration, uh, put in, these, in, in this sort of context, we're talking about breaking down carbohydrates to ultimately make uh, ATPs. So glycolysis, glucose split, that's the name. It, where does it occur? In the cytoplasm, as shown. It's anaerobic. Now these steps, these, you'll see that the first three steps are all anaerobic. What anaerobic means is that they just don't involve oxygen. So aerobic means involving oxygen. Anaerobic means doesn't involve oxygen. But we have to go through three anaerobic steps just to get to an aerobic, an aerobic step, not anaerobic step. And this is way simplified, okay? Uh, if you take a graduate level cellular physiology class, you'll have to learn all of these steps, and there's a dozen or so of them, and a, do you know, a dozen enzymes that are responsible and various different functional groups that are attached and detached. So if you're like, oh, there's so much stuff, this is so simple, it's not even funny. Six glucose in, six, sorry, six carbon in glucose. That is split through a number of reactions. Ultimately, we get, this is our end product. And I wrote them twice, because we get two pyruvates. Each pyruvate has three carbons. So we start with six carbons. We end up here at the end of glycolysis with six total carbons, just split into two different molecules. 
Now, over the course of that reaction set, we're going to generate some ATP, which is what we want to do in the first place. We want to make ATP, um, and we can, we'll take it in little bits at the beginning, and then we'll take it in that big, you know, uh, big pile at the end. So we generate about two ATP here in glycolysis, and we also produce about two NADH. Now, NADH, you don't have to know, I'm not gonna have you memorize the, the name, it's nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. But this is a molecule that is going to act, and I wrote here, as an electron carrier. Maybe a better way to say it is an electron shuttle. So a shuttle bus, if you've ever taken a, if you've ever gone to a, a, a sporting event where it's, you park way out in the middle of, you know, wherever, on the distant part of the parking lot, and a little shuttle bus will come and get you, take you to the gate, drop you off, and then you try to remember which, where you were, so then when, when you come out of the game or whatever, you say, okay, I'm, I'm in this area. So that, that same bus, or maybe a different bus, will take you all the way out there, right? So these guys, and the bus just do, does these laps. So NADH, NAD+, plus, which is the, uh, the not reduced version of it, but this N nicotinamide molecule acts as a, an electron carrier, so or a shuttle. So it's gonna grab electrons here in, gl in glycolysis and take them to step four, take them to uh, the last step reaction set, which is electron transport. So whenever we see these guys made, I'll put a little box around them. Whenever we see them made, just you know keep track of them, two here, and we'll deal with them later, okay? Uh, sum total here, we got, if you wanna take the super take home points, in glycolysis, glucose is split into two pyruvates, no carbons are lost, we get two ATPs made, two NADHs produced, which we'll deal with momentarily. Moving on to the what I call the transition reaction. And here's, here's my little drawing of the uh, of a mitochondrial outer and inner membrane. So this is kind of where it takes place. And I said, uh, it, over here I said it takes place in the cytoplasm. Here I'm going to say it takes place as pyruvate is moved into the mitochondria. Because we need to get the the the, hydro, the the organic molecules in here if we're going to put them through some a process that's located in here. They're mostly Krebs cycle and electron transport. So we've got a movement. Now in this case, each of these pyruvates has three carbons. During that transport into the mitochondria, a carbon is lost from each. So if I have a three carbon molecule, if I have two three carbon molecules and I lose a carbon from each in the form of carbon dioxide, I'll lose total two carbon dioxide. So you can see here that reflected two pyruvates become two acetyl-CoA molecules, which have two carbons each. So there's four carbons here, two more carbons here, and that equals the total carbons that were in this pyruvate. Now this brings up an interesting point. When you think of the term respiration, you think first of this, right? You think of breathing uh, in and out. And when you think of respiration, this breathing, you think uh, oxygen in, probably, and carbon dioxide out. You breathe in oxygen, and you breathe out carbon dioxide. Now that's a little oversimplified, obviously. There is more carbon dioxide in your exhaled breath than there was in the inhaled breath, and there's more oxygen when you inhale than you exhale. So yes, you're using oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide. Uh, but that's kind of the order we think about it. We think of it as oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. Have we used oxygen yet? Nope, these two steps are both anaerobic. But this is carbon dioxide that will go into your blood from your cells. These are these mitochondria are in cells, muscle cells, or whatever kind of cells. They're releasing carbon dioxide, which goes to your blood, which gets transported back to your uh, heart, which goes back to your lungs, and then you exhale. And so you're breathing out carbon dioxide. That carbon, those carbons, were part of these molecules which were part of this molecule, glucose. So literally, you're exhaling food that you ate earlier. That's, there's no, there's no metaphor. It's, that's literally what's going on. So, so I just exhaled some, uh, some rice and a, like a Korean uh, a noodle dish. It was really delicious. But there it goes. Something's coming out. Now it's not gonna smell like that. It's, I mean, my breath may smell like that, but that's, these guys don't smell, that's not a, a flavored carbon, it's just carbon, right? But it was in the sugar that was in my food. And we'll see that we actually get rid of all the carbons before we even meet oxygen. So let's go back to this. Uh, two pyruvates are moved in, forming two acetyl-CoA, 
and let's get, show me the money here. We're gonna make uh, two NADH. It's not supposed to be a negative, but it's just gonna smash. Whatever, two, two NADHs. Good to go. Where do they go? Go to step four, deal with them later. So now we have some acetyl-CoA, we have two of them, four carbons total left, that we find in the mitochondrial matrix. If you remember that this place where my, where the stick is, that's the mitochondrial matrix. So that's where the next reaction set occurs, right here. And it's called the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle. So it was named after somebody named Hans Krebs who discovered it, uh, and that's how I learned it. But it makes kind of more sense to call it citric acid cycle, call it whichever you like. Just remember there's two names. Where does it occur? In the mitochondrial matrix. It is still anaerobic. There's no oxygen used or needed. And it's not very graphically interesting, but these two acetyl-CoA are completely oxidized. So what, that means that they're going to be broken down. We combine the acetyl-CoA with a molecule that goes through a whole big number of reactions. We're not going to get into that. Just suffice it to say that in this reaction set called Krebs cycle, those acetyl-CoA's are, are uh, disarticulated. They're broken down. That's a catabolic reaction. And that's going to release some energy, which we can capture by making some of these molecules again, right? So during this process, we get two ATP. That's another little bonus there. Three, you know, ATP made along the way. But we're also going to make a total of six NADH and FD, uh, uh, sorry, two FADH2s. Uh, and notice that four carbon dioxides are released. So four carbon dioxides here plus two carbon dioxides here makes a total of six carbon, which was all that was present in my uh, glucose to begin with. So by the time we get to the place where we're going to make the most ATP, by the time we get to the aerobic step, we've already effectively exhaled all of the carbons that were making up that glucose. So you've already breathed out your food. By the time we get to step four, which we'll go right over here to see, and that's the electron transport chain. Now I've got a little graphic here because I say that it takes place. The first line here is going to be where it's take place takes place along the mitochondrial inner membrane. So here's that little inner membrane weaving its way along. And you can see this is the matrix where Krebs cycle took place. And this is that intermembrane space. So this is the space between these two membranes, which we're going to use. We're going to pack it full of something. And we'll see what, what good that does us. So here comes an NADH. And let me, just so we can recognize them, a little box around them there. Right? There it is. Um, but really what we have are, we've got six of these. Sorry, there we go. We've got 10 of these because if you count two from glycolysis, two from transition reaction, six from Krebs cycle, total of 10. And then we also made those two FADH2s right here, which are again, uh, an electron shuttle. And we got two FADH2s. These guys, as I mentioned, are called electron carriers or electron shuttles. So their job is to show up here with the electrons that they uh, accumulated in the previous steps, show up here and release those electrons. These little circles I've drawn here <coughs> represent members of the electron transport chain. So it's going to be this chain of molecules. Most of them are uh, proteins and there's some other strange compounds that you're going to Take an electron, you're going to give it to them. So I'm going to hand the electron to the next guy. And that guy will take the electron and hand it to the next guy. And that guy will take the electron and hand it to the next guy. So it's going to pass these electrons. And they call this a fall of electrons. I've drawn it kind of laterally here. It doesn't literally fall. But the electrons are being passed from one energy state to a lower energy state to a lower energy state to a lower energy state. So I'm handing them off down a hill. And any time you pass something from a high energy state to a low energy state, that energy doesn't go anywhere, right? If you remember the first law of thermodynamics, it doesn't, you can never get rid of it. It's always there. So that energy is still there. It's just that the electron doesn't have it anymore. So what we do with that energy is we use it, these little members of this electron transport chain, use it to grab hydrogens and stuff them in here. So grab hydrogens from the matrix and stuff them into this intermembrane space. If we look back over here, after NADH gives up its electrons, it liberates hydrogens and 
it becomes a molecule that goes back. You don't have, it becomes what's called NAD plus. NAD plus goes back and grabs another electron, turns into NADH, comes back, goes back and gets an electron, goes back. So it's just, that's the shuttle nature of it. But let's go here to this thing. So as these electrons fall in energy, hydrogens are stuck in here. And anytime you start building up, anytime you get a bunch of people in a crowded room or whatever, they're gonna start they're gonna start to diffuse away from that. When you get a bunch of, of molecules in one spot, they diffuse away from that. There's gonna be a concentration gradient which will incline them to go somewhere else. Problem is, there's nowhere to go. They can't, they're stuck in this space, right? There's only one doorway out of here. And that doorway is over here. This molecule right here that I've drawn, this two-part molecule, is a, a little uh, a transport protein, a channel protein. And it's, it has an enzymatic attachment. This molecule is called ATP. Synthase. So a molecule, whenever you see that ASE ending, you think enzyme. And a molecule that says ATP synthase tells you what it does. It synthesizes ATP. Where does it get the energy for this? Well, I've stuffed a bunch of hydrogen ions in this intermembrane space. I'm just like, I'm like uh, bailing out the boat. I'm bailing out the rowboat, but there's a hole, so it keeps leaking back in. So as these NADHs keep arriving and bringing in these electrons, these electron transport members stuff them in here, and they keep on leaking back in through this ATP synthase. So there's this water wheel effect here, where you're pushing the, pushing the hydrogens in, they're leaking back through. Pushing the hydrogen in, leaking back through. This force right here of these, uh, these hydrogens constantly flowing back into the matrix through ATP synthase is where we get the energy to add phosphate to ADP and make ATP. The energy that you that is possessed by those 10 NADH molecules and those two F, uh, NA, uh, sorry, FADH2 molecules is enough to generate about 34 ATP down at this end. So once we get down to the, to the tail end of this reaction set, you can generate about 34 ATP. That's just the energy that was possessed by those electrons that was, that was held by NADH and FADH2 in those electrons, which they ultimately got from their uh, glucose molecule. So all this does come down from a glucose molecule. Now, as these electrons, there's one kind of interesting thing here. As these electrons are passed, so this is an electron, 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 eventually you reach the last person in the line, right? So everybody's had somebody to pass the electron to until you get to the last person in the chain, or the last you know, molecule in the chain. So now I've got this electron, and I'm like, who am I gonna give it to? There's nobody that wants it. None of the people, none of the molecules that live in the, the membrane want it. I can't throw it away, it doesn't work that way, it's bonded to me. I just need to give it to something that's got, that will possess it at a lower energy state. I need to kind of hand it downhill. And there's only one molecule around that, we're, that we use to do that. And there it is right there. Oops, I just erased part of it. So it's usually not written there. It's O, it's just, you know, half of a diatomic oxygen molecule. So it's just a single oxygen atom. But it's willing to pick up these electrons. I'm, it comes by and it says, yeah, I'll take them. In doing so, it acquires a negative state and it attracts hydrogens. So when you attach a single oxygen to two hydrogens and throw a couple electrons on there, you get water. This water right here is called metabolic water. I gotta write this in. And you make metabolic water all the time. You're manufacturing water in your cells 24-7. Uh, some animals can live on it. There's some desert animals, mammals even, that can live without drinking water ever because they get enough water and conserve enough water uh, from, their, from their metabolism. But let me take this back. So, so that's actually, this, this, is what makes, uh, this is what makes the electron transport chain aerobic and what effectively makes this whole process aerobic is that we need oxygen right here. Now the oxygen has, gets a title. It's called the final electron acceptor. If you're watching this video right now, write that down. 
Oxygen is the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. It's the only guy around that's going to want to grab those, those, uh, those electrons. Where do we get the oxygen? Right there, right? That's how I got it. You get the oxygen by inhaling, moving the oxygen from your lungs into your blood, moving the blood down to your body, moving the oxygen out of the blood into the cells, and that's where we get it. So what happens if I, if I'm like, in a in a, a, a slasher movie or something, and there's somebody like this, right? And I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna suddenly get a go, right? And then if it's the bad guy, he usually gets up later. But if I'm dead, what did I die of? Did I die of lack of oxygen? Nope. I died of lack of ATP. Oxygen's just there to pick up the trash, pick up this electron. So if I take it out of the picture, if I take oxygen out of the picture, right? Or my thing is I say if you get out of the submarine early, right? So if you get out before it gets to the top, you're going to breathe water. You're not going to have oxygen from that water. If I take away that oxygen, then all of these electrons start backing up. So if this guy's full of electrons and this guy's full of electrons and this guy's full of electrons and so on and so on, NADH can't pass electrons, and if you can't pass the electrons down through this chain, you're not going to stuff hydrogen into this space, and if this hydrogen gradient doesn't build up, it's not going to leak through ATP synthase, and if you're not leaking uh, hydrogens back into the matrix, you're not going to make ATP, and what ATP does for you is basically everything, like I started off with. When I want to do this, that's ATP, does that, right? When I want to send a nervous impulse to that muscle to contract, that takes ATP. When I want to think about what I'm going to say next, that takes ATP. When my heart wants to beat, that takes ATP. So any, as soon as that ATP supply gets cut off, all of my systems stop. The oxygen is just a, you know, kind of a, a, a middleman here taking electrons away from the whole scene, right? If you get rid of those electrons some, some other way, you wouldn't need oxygen. But that's how we evolved in this oxygen atmosphere to be aerobic organisms. Now, the reason we use oxygen, uh, and the, ma uh, the majority of organisms on the planet are, are aerobic, is that it gets you a bunch of ATP. This total right here is what, like eh, 20 times more roughly or so, a little bit less. 16 to 20 times more than you get just from anaerobic respiration, which was done way at the beginning when we talked about glycolysis. Everybody can do glycolysis, even anaerobic organisms, but they only get two ATP. By setting it through this whole long process, we can get a total of two from glycolysis, two from Krebs cycle, and then 34 from this uh, electron transport chain. This is all from one glucose. Now this is a real optimistic number here, 38. But that 38, under optimal conditions, you can get that many ATP from a single glucose, whereas if you're going through anaerobic respiration only, you stop at glycolysis. You don't go on to the next steps. They're just to get you to, to uh, the electron transport. All right, so let me go back over to the board. I'll kill the lights here. I'll go back over to the projector, and uh, we'll see what we got. I'll just kind of. So here we are back here. Hopefully this now. Hopefully this can make sense. If you've watched that that explanation, this makes sense. We're in. We've eaten food. It is disassembled, and we can get glucose out of it. Now I'm going to send it through reaction sets. Glycolysis breaks it into two pyruvates, which generate two ATP. Move it into the mitochondrion. I'm going to lose some carbon dioxide, not shown here. But I'll generate two NADH. I had already generated them here in glycolysis as well. So two, four NADH. When that acetyl-CoA goes into Krebs cycle, I'm going to generate six more NADH. That's two, four, ten. And two FADH2s, which are kind of like this guy's kid brother. They don't generate as much energy, but they're, they do some. All of these electron shuttles head to electron transport, where they're, the electrons are passed from member of the electron transport chain to member of the electron transport chain, pushing them, pushing the hydrogens in here, they flush back through the ATP synthase, and that generates 34. So 
uh, 2 plus 2, 2 plus 2 plus 34, 38. And the whole time we need oxygen as the final electron acceptor because if oxygen is not there, the whole process backs up. ATP, our, our metabolisms need a lot of ATP and uh, just glycolysis is not enough for that. So that's so you, so you never die of oxygen deprivation, you die of ATP deprivation. And I think that's it.